Okay, um, I think we should start. <coughs> Looking around, it's, uh, it's a little bit like going to the cinema in the 60s. Um, you spot some people who wanted to kind of go to the main attraction and, and thought they'd give the sort of experimental Bulgarian animation film a kind of miss. <laughs> Uh, and they're always phoning up saying, what exactly, what time does the main one start? But don't worry, we, <laughs> we know who you are. <laughs> it won't pass. Um, rather than myself make a fool of myself, uh, we've asked Simon Baker to... <laughs> Not again! Anyone else want to do it? <laughs> I'm going to ask Simon Baker to introduce Pavin. Simon is an art historian and an art critic and currently engaged, uh, indeed did the, one of the catalogues uh, for the recent uh, Chapman Brothers show and is working on something that I think many of us are looking forward to very much, uh, the Bataille show uh, at the Hayward in the summer, when hopefully we'll try to get him back again to the AA uh, to talk about it. So, Simon. Okay, thank you very much. So, I'm introducing Parveen, who many of you uh, already know. Um, she organized this series of lectures uh, around the idea of the intermediate object, and that's something that will be developed in the, the paper she's giving this evening. Parveen uh, taught for uh, many years at Brunel University, where she continues to teach on the psychoanalysis and the society MA, and, and she's also an honorary research fellow at Birkbeck College and on the teaching faculty of the London Consortium. Parveen is well known as the co-founder and co-editor of the um, journal MF, um, a selection of articles from which are, avail are still available as um, the woman in question. Uh, her own books, um, which I'm sure seems like a strange thing to do because probably you already know these books, but include The Emptiness of the Image with incredible essays on ranging from Francis Bacon, Mary Kelly to uh, Michael Powell and Orlan to the um, more recently uh, art sublimation or symptom, which introduces the late Lacanian concept of the saint -Homme. And there is a series of articles as well on Cronenberg's crash, um, which um, I was fortunate enough to see as lectures uh, around the same framework. Of m great interest to many of you who are here for the uh, wonderful talk last week um, by Thomas Demand, Parveen's just published, it's either out now or just about to be out, um, an essay, Out of Sight, Out of Body, The Sugimoto Demand Effect, which is in Grey Room, a journal published by MIT. So I don't want to say very much more at all. I came to um, Parveen's work through a course on psychoanalysis and the image here at the AA, so I'm very pleased to be back here introducing her. And as you might expect, for an art historian, as I was introduced as, it was something of a, a revelation and something that I've probably not quite recovered from yet. Um, what, I've exper what I experienced at the time um, in Parveen's approach to the relationship of those terms, psychoanalysis and the image, um, were at odds with and in a sense out of reach of um, many art historians who are engaged in um, deploying uh, Lacanian theory. Parveen, um, on the other hand, remains uh, absolutely grounded in a Lacanian discourse and uses it as a, a position from which to speak, which seems to be, to me, to be a more principled but more complex and challenging way of working. Um, the challenge, if you like, of tonight's paper is the work of Jake and Dinos Chapman. Um, the title of the paper is Hanged, Drawn and Quartered, or Goya After the Chapmans. I'd like you to so welcome, Pavi.
Uh, I hope that I have um, managed to make what Lacan there is in this talk uh, palatable. Uh, there are very, very few points at which I'm doing anything like straight theory, and they usually last for a minute or two. Um, so I hope you uh, enjoy the paper. I'll start from a quotation from Lacan's Ethics Seminar. The element in comedy that satisfies us, the element that makes us laugh, that makes us appreciate it in its full human dimension, is not so much the triumph of life as its flight. The fact that life slips away, runs off, escapes all those barriers that oppose it, including precisely those that are the most essential, those that are constituted by the agency of the signifier. And in a sense, the paper is an argument uh, that the way in which uh, I will outline the structure of comedy is a structure that fits the work uh, of the Chapman brothers. In Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors, an initial confusion of persons spirals out of control. <clears throat> there is something unbearable in this. Something in us wants to call out that it is the husband, the good husband, the real husband who is at the door. Is this pain intensified or alleviated by watching a look-alike who now comes to dinner in his place? Both. The pain is increased because of the flouting of the symbolic order, and it is alleviated because of the flouting of the symbolic order. This double register finds its elementary projection in narratives concerning siblings. These may be about identical twins, since it overlays the question of kinship with that of the identity of appearance. But the narratives do not have to be about identical twins. The issue of being siblings is ultimately the identity which is crucial. At a structural level, the aspect of brothers or sisters <coughs> is that they produce a dangerous concession to disordered narratives. Brothers always suggest an arithmetic of halving and doubling. The brothers are both two appearances of one position, the son of, the same father, and at the same time, they are two positions of one appearance. Indeed, it runs beyond the formal question of siblings. The very supposed family resemblance between kin is a sort of monstrosity. Insofar as a family unit is considered from the point of view of sexual prohibition, the operation of the incest taboo has the paradoxical effect of setting up relations of resemblance where the situation calls for quite the opposite, differentiation. We may think of this as a dimension of monstrosity which runs through kinship. Normally, and certainly in the comedy of errors, the pain caused by the flouting of the symbolic order <clears throat> is too overwhelming to offset its alleviation through laughter. The narrative ends with the inevitable resolution of all misunderstandings and misidentifications. Anxiety is dispelled, and the audience is reconfirmed in its identification with the law. Of course, there is a cost. The contented subject can now no longer grasp the virtue of holding to his previous irresolution. The world in which subjects and positions are routinely confused or travestied, a world in which there is a systematic multiplication and division in the subject's enjoyment of the world, has now gone. The subject now makes the mistake of confusing life with the law. But what the comedy showed before its own self-censorship is that the vivacity of the staged confusion is nothing less than life slipping away from the law, as Lacan might put it. My argument is that the work of the Chapmans follows this structure of comedy. The Chapmans produce two appearances of the same, or to put it another way, they produce a gap between two appearances. As in the case of narrative, <coughs> identity and appearance, sameness and splitting is the artist's production. The Chapmans don't do this through the theme of brothers as the subject matter of their work. 
Of course, they collaborate as artists, and they are, in fact, brothers. However, the way in which they produce two appearances of the same is a separate, if related, matter. And the monstrosity they produce, sorry, I wanted to have the first slide just. Um, and the monstrosity that they produce has more to do with the work and less to do with being brothers. The sameness is the oneness of their own work with that of the 18th century artist Goya. At the same time, the work remains separate and thus more than one. The Chapmans have cited Goya in various forms for over a decade. From the early 1990s till 2004, their interest was focused on the series of etchings known as the Disasters of War. Their 1993 Disasters is a work exhibited at waist height. They don't have any other slides of it, uh, and that doesn't really give you uh, a good idea. Um, it's a work exhibited at waist height, made up of over 83 separate, roughly made miniature models in a roughly circular space. The Disasters of War have had 83 original etchings. So each one is matched by a small model. In the following year, 1994, the Chapmans converted an etching from this series uh, called Great Deeds Against the Dead into a large-scale sculpture with the same title, which was shown at the Royal Academy in the Sensation Exhibition. They have produced other variously named works that relate to disasters. There is the eponymous series of Chapman etchings. These bear a loose relation to the originals and the brothers have run riot with swastikas, dirty jokes, skulls, phalluses, monsters, and anal smoke. White Cube failed to make the slide of the anal smoke, I'm sorry. Uh, then still focused on disasters, there is From Insult to Injury, a title indicative of a new move, which is the culmination of previous work. The Chapmans are now intruding directly onto an original set of Goya's disasters. In 2005, they go further still when they paint over another set, original set of Goya's etchings, Los Capriccios, transformed in their title into Like a Dog Returns to Its Vomit. This time, the repetitions with the difference resonate in all directions. <coughs> it is hard to sort out the two appearances of the one and the one appearance of the two. It is as though Goya was working on the Chapman's work even as they worked on his. No one was ever going to sort this out. What is it that the Chapman brothers do and to what effect? My answer to the first question is that they reverse the relation of influence that usually holds in artistic traditions. Art historians are fond of tracing influences, but they would be hard put to use their framework to explain the Chapman's relation to Goya's disasters of war, what they took from it, what they developed, etc. This is because there is a reverse influence. There is a retrospective projection onto Goya with paint. It opens up a new dimension of the intermediate, not now a measure of distance or proximity, it's not in between two things, more an autonomous substance, but a substance so strange that it makes the object unrecognizable. Object qua object, unrecognizable. The intermediate object now establishes the inseparability of two bodies of work. It is not a question of a third object, such as the hybrid, nor is it a question of the convergence of two trajectories in a common object. It is a question of the gap between objects. Now, across the work of Goya and the Chapman brothers, there are the two appearances of one position and the two positions of one appearance that describe the relation between brothers. The clear separation between two distinct physical objects blurs as the Chapman's intervention gorges on meaning, only to emit vomit. What is left in play is life that runs off and escapes its signifying barriers. The structure of comedy insists. 
There are two answers to the question of the effect of the work. The first is that at a general level, the work concerns the satisfaction of the drive. This is something that is common to much art. The trickier task is to establish how that satisfaction is achieved in this particular instance. That argument concerns the gap between two appearances. Paradoxical as it may seem, it is in making their work and Goya's inseparable that the Chapmans at one and the same time produce a gap. I will show this later when I talk about the particular uh, sets of relations between disasters and insult to injury and Los Capriccios and Like a Dog Returns to Its Vomit. There is the well-known paradigm of drive satisfaction in Lacan's Seminar 11, The Four Fundamental Concepts, where the signifier circles around the lost and never to be refound object, the objet petit art, and the satisfaction of the drive is this circling itself. But the Chapmans don't circle around the lost object. They connect with it directly. They do this by creating the gap. This is not, of course, the gap that exists between any two bodies of work. The gap comes from the splitting of one into two. The Chapman's work on Goya produces, via an unexpected temporality, the one that is then perceived to split in two. It is a feature of the lost object that it is something that retrospectively appears as having been part of the infant's body. But we are not talking about a splitting of this kind. The Chapman's work does not mark the moment when we lose something. We have already lost breast, feces, phallus. It is almost as if in a kind of reverse move, we are at the point before the constitution of the lost object, at the point where breast, feces, and phallus are not separate from us. We could say that we are before or that we are beyond signification. We inhabit a brief moment outside the body, a moment when we partake of the real. Let me explain. The body is not a physical entity only. It is constituted for the subject through a series of separations in a discursive field. For Lacan, the body and its jouissance are, of course, products of language. Animals, he claims, do not have bodies. The animal remains an organism. The work of the Chapmans returns us to a moment outside our zoned bodies. It does this by creating that form of the lost object which I have called the intermediate object, a substance. Now I add that it is substance as nothing and that this nothing is the real. If the Chapman's work has the structure of comedy, what of Goya's? The repetition with the difference that produces the two appearances of the same does not, of course, have to be a repetition of something that itself has the structure of comedy. Indeed, I think there is nothing in Goya that fits our definition and nothing that suggests that Goya produced intermediate objects. We have to look elsewhere for an explanation of the effects of the Chapman's intervention in these two sets of etchings. A moment ago, I claimed that the Chapman's work allows us a fleeting retreat from the body and its jouissance. Let us take what is at first sight a surprising example of such a claim. This is the 1994 sculpture, Great Deeds Against the Dead, uh, which I mentioned earlier. It has a direct reference uh, to Goya's etching of the same name. Uh, you saw the Chapman's version of that right at the beginning. The Chapmans say that they wanted to make Goya's world devoid of expression. Interviewed by Damianovich in 1997, they said, we are interested in making a dead sculpture, dead in content and dead or inert in materiality. What do we see? Figures in their castrated and decapitated parts stuck on trees, which are dead. The original Goya tree had some leaves. There is also the deadness of the inert, bland material from which they are made. There is nothing human about them. The Chapman's pit flesh against fiberglass. They oppose the human, the living, the suffering to the inert. Dead in content and dead in materiality. It is often said that we enjoy Goya's disasters of war, 
that we enjoy the horror of it. This is what Lacan called jouissance. It is what Freud noted on the face of his famous patient, the rat man, as the latter told him the story of the torture where rats are introduced into the anus. Freud writes, I could only interpret it as one of horror at pleasure of his own, of which he himself was unaware. The Chapman sculpture is horrifying, but it is without this element of enjoyment. Philip Shaw, in a 2003 article on the Chapmans and Goya, um, uh, the Disasters at War series, the Los Capriccios was only shown in November last year, um, argues that the total deadness of Great Deeds II, as it's known, the sculpture, um, argues that via the total deadness of Great Deeds II, the effect of the Chapman's plasticized wounds is to nullify the gaze. We go beyond the object gaze and confront the real, its emptiness. I agree that this is a direct relation to the real, but I attribute this to the gap the Chapman's open up between what Shaw calls the obscene vitality of the etching and the inertness of the sculpture. Or rather to the gap opened up within the sculpture which is now inhabited by Goya's image. In this way, that image is emptied of the effects of jouissance of which it is often accused. You may want to protest that I am talking nonsense and that the sculpture is both violent and monstrous. I would agree that you are right, but also say that you are wrong. At a descriptive level, one does indeed use these words, but neither horror nor suffering is subject matter for the Chapmans. The shock horror that there is, is best explained in terms of the operation of the intermediate object the blurring of the boundaries of works. Added to which is the shock horror of the non-origin of the intermediate artist, the result of the collaboration between brothers. Audiences have to go beyond the question of the ostensible subject matter. In this case, the Chapman's work is about the relation both to Goya and to each other. It is this relation that yields the Chapman effect. They shock you out of horror. We now return to the question of what there is about the way in which Goya worked that allows the Chapmans to succeed in what they have done. How do they relate to his motifs? Victor Stoichiter, in his book Goya, The Last Carnival, has emphasized the tradition that is important for disasters. We can say, very schematically, that carnival was traditionally a temporary reversal of values, a destructuring of societal mores, a disorder, a joy in the face of relative chaos, as Stoichiter puts it. The idea of the book is that although Carnival ceased to be a popular and joyful period of release, there was a permanent carnivalization in jo Goya's work. He used the forces of disorder, the underbelly of things, through the themes of human animal, low sexuality, and violence to characterize not Carnival, but the world. Tragedy does not strictly belong to Carnival, yet within Goya's carnivalization of the world, Stoichita detects a growing tendency toward tragedy, at least in the disasters. What is it that Goya is doing in Etching 37 of Disasters? Uh, its title, this is worse. I'm sorry, these translations vary a great deal um, of the original types, subtitles as it were to the etchings. It shows a mutilated human figure pierced from anus to shoulder. It is interesting that Stoichita relates this image to the work of another artist, he who made the classical Belvedere torso of Hercules, which Goya had seen and drawn in the Italian notebook. Being just a torso, this Her Hercules is mutilated. Stoichita says that for Goya, it characterized the distorted classical form, a hyperbolized and at the same time denigrated human body. By impaling the Belvedere torso on a dead tree, Goya produces, I quote, a link between the degradation of the notion of the human and that of classical form. Goya comments on the original image by transforming it. His etching goes against everything that the torso once stood for. This etching represents the movement in Goya whereby the carnivalesque moves into something else, where violence takes over as a depiction of the world. Stoichita shows how the reversals that carnival entails 
high, low human animal and the emphasis on sexuality <coughs> continue to be used by Goya now in his depiction of the world, in his exposure of it. The degradation of the notion of the human that is allowable to carnival takes on a different meaning when the temporary reversal entrenches itself as a permanent feature of a lawless world. Stoichita seems to see this move in, as a move into tragedy. But listen to what Philip Shaw has to say about this matter. As I said, the very first slide was the Chapman version of that from insult to injury. This is what Philip Shaw says. Three figures echoing the crucifixion. The tableau convulses the taboo that offers the loathsome corpse as a counterbalance to sacrifice. Instead of differentiating the abject and the sacred, Goya succeeds in a kind of violent yoking, suffusing the abject with sacrificial meaning while subjecting the sacred to sadomasochistic defilement. If this is true, how does the Chapman's intervention make a difference? The difference is because is made because they both alter and at the same time stay true to Goya. It would be wrong to overlook what we learn about Goya from the Chapman's interventions, for their changes make us attend to aspects of Goya's own moves that we have missed. Let's take the Chapman's overpainted version of Great Deeds. There was a distinction in my childhood between a chest of drawers and what was called a hanging cupboard. In great deeds, it is not clothes, but human parts that we see hanging on the branches of the rail. And in one corner, we see a head hung up like a hat. The body is distributed as clothes might be, a piece here and a piece there. But of course, that is already in Goya. The horror is in the fact that the body can be thought of in this way, as something that can be taken apart. There are all the parts, as though they might indeed be put together again. Other etchings show us hung bodies, like puppets in pain. The Chapmans pick out the faces on such bodies and turn them into astonished or terrified animals and clowns. Number 32, I haven't got a slide of it, a man is being hanged. He has slipped down the tree, the rope tight around his neck. His face is white and his hair stands on end around his face. In the Chapman's version, the shock is registered by ginger hair standing on end, and the face has been transformed into a red-eyed mask with large ears and a large red mouth with tiny teeth. There is another example where the face is already picked out for the Chapman's. Uh, this is worse, the one you saw, the, the man was staked. The face of final agony in white, and the hair stands up upright and sideways. Again, the Chapman's have overpainted the face. They take their cue from Goya. They elaborate on these important moments and alter them in keeping at a certain level with the thrust of the original. While being astonished at the intervention of color in the children's world of animals and clowns, we dimly register the resonance with the original. Sorry, something's wrong. Can you see the two heads of the children that have been made into kind of hydrocephalic heads and painted? I'm not sure what slide number I'm on. <coughs> Number 20. In etching 75, which is this one, um, there is a central kneeling figure with the grinning face of a bear, complete with red nose, large round ears, and a wide mouth stuffed with small teeth. That is the Chapman version. But the face was picked out already by Goya in the form of the face of a beaked bird or the shoulders of a human figure. The interchangeability of parts is as important as the theme of fragmentation. Sorry, one was Chapman, one is Goya. I leave, leave you to work it out. <laughs> uh, off with one head, put another head on. The Chapmans have always been interested in the taking apart and putting together of parts. Jake Chapman, apropos of zygotic acceleration, says, in leaving intact the lines between the arms and the torso, you divide the body into sections that are removable. Goya, too, knows about the changing of parts, and the Chapmans play with this. 
They introduce the world of the cartoon and the rhythm of illustrations from children's book, books. Look at the horse's purple head and rolling surprised human eyes. They have cut, that's the original Goya. They have cartoonized the animal, anthropomorphized it, in that always happens, which you're looking at now. That's the Goya version. The purple head, which I haven't got, with long rabbit ears on a human figure belongs to the same world. The heads are bigger than the ones they replace, and they can be differently oriented. For example, a woman in one of the etchings is looking out at us where previously she was turned and appealed to the man behind her. So there's a direct appeal to, to the viewer. I don't know quite what you make uh, of this. Cartoons and clowns are of themselves the other side of savagery. Yet by overpainting the etchings in the way they do, the Chapmans avoid the puissance of the originals. Sorry, that uh, slide's a bit ahead. Okay, I've now put together materials for an answer to my earlier question about Goya, the Chapmans, and the structure of comedy. The work of the Chapmans shares the structure of comedy because of the way it relates to the etchings at the level of motif. It is at that level that the Chapmans can produce the splitting of the one into two, the gap that is the real. Goya's etchings open onto the real in a different way, not through the minimum distance that comedy can employ, but through the palpitations of an obscene suffering. We now ask the question of what there is about the way in which Goya worked that allows the Chapman to succeed with, like a dog returns to its vomit. This time they have gorged on Goya's Los Capriccios. Andrew Schultz has written about Los Capriccios as satire. It's not about the Chapmans at all. He stresses the importance of the senses, especially vision and hearing, for enlightenment theories of knowledge. He claims that Goya's depiction of the sense organs, particularly eyes and mouths, is a central component of the mechanics of satire in Los Capriccios. Take Los Chinchillas, that's the family name, and you're seeing it. These noblemen have their eyes closed and their ears padlocked. They can't observe or experience, but rely on tradition. Here the satirical marks the absence of connection between sense perception and knowledge. And I know someone who, when I told her that the padlocks were the original Goya, simply couldn't believe it, because she had gone along and absolutely assumed that they must be the Chapmans. By contrast with the theme of blindness or visual insufficiency through the depiction of closed eyes, in contrast with this, mouths remain wide open in Los Capriccios. Sorry, I'm getting a bit lost with the slides. The series also has many images and captions containing allusions to swallowing, blowing, vomiting, sucking, yawning, sh shouting, snoring, and most commonly eating and drinking. Los Capriccios portrays beasts, not humans. Los Chinchillas are precisely such monstrous figures. Schultz argues that there are many examples of the overturning of the Enlightenment architecture of the body. A particularly striking example, which I could not get a slide off in time for today, uh, is a drawing that is not part of the series, but is very closely related to something that is in the series. I think it's the, the, the slide I wanted which is called Merry Caricature, which I couldn't get. And in it, there is a huge phallus extending from the man's face. It's actually supported by a strut uh, from, from, the t from the table, um, uh, which then makes the kind of round opening of the mouth look rather like uh, an anus. It's a, it's a very striking uh, image, which he obviously toned down for the, for the series. Uh, so he's got, what he's got is a figure in monk's clothes seated at a table, shoveling food into his mouth. Blasts of wind inverts mouth and anus. If Goya has produced a bestial world, the Chapmans working directly on the images of Los Capriccios play with the same motifs. In so doing, they intervene in the world that Goya depicts. Clearly, the two sets of motifs do not cancel each other out to return us to square one, but neither do they add up. The Chapmans do not underscore Goya's enlightenment judgment of the world. In one sense, they are repeating what Goya did. They use very similar bestial motifs. 
But what they are doing on Goya's images is not quite identical to what Goya did on paper in the first place. Goya was using well-known 18th century ways of representing bestiality in the age of reason. His images are satirical and play on the gap between the ideals and the reality of the Enlightenment. When the Chapmans come along and do what looks like more of the same, they do it with no such intent. What is the effect? The Chapmans intervene not to repeat Goya or add to him, but to intensify Goya beyond the limits of Los Capriccios. In turn, this means breaking the very links which Goya had maintained within satire. For to satirize, to point out the gap between the ideal and the reality, is still to connect the two. The difference of what Chapman's do and what Goya does can be marked through the treatment of eyes in the images. In Goya's work, the eyes are increasingly subordinated to the human organs of mouths and anuses. Gluttony seems the function of all organs, including the sexual organs. Knowledge and enlightenment, the sphere of the ideals, is subordinated to what is gross and debased. The Chapmans intervened within this at the level of the eyes, and it was very, very striking in the, in the exhibition in November, the eyes everywhere. In The Sleep of Reason, when you're looking at the Chapman version of it, one does indeed find many eyes, but they belong to the monstrous birds. What can we say about the very many eyes in the Chapman's reworking of Los Capriccios? Dozens of eyes as rounded spheres, minuscule multiple elements of other eyes, or eyes protruding on the end of stalks. We can say that these are not human eyes. Sorry. Um. We can say that these are not human eyes, and the form of the eye is certainly not that of the oculus of the Enlightenment. They are obscene organs, no longer related to knowledge, and no longer in harmony with a knowable world. The Chapmans are not satirical either in their intent or in their effect. There are now eyes and mouths and tongues and masks and humans with animal heads everywhere. And now the features, the motifs that were tied to systems of meaning, have torn loose from their moorings and overrun the scene. Many people who saw like a dog were uncertain to whom a particular detail should be attributed. One almost thinks that Goya is involved in a repetition of the Chapmans. With the overpainting of this set of etchings, the Chapmans almost literally take the path that Goya took. They add impossibly long noses, large ears. Animals, monsters, and birds abound. This is more of Los Capriccios. They lay on death, sex, maggots, cruelty. These editions are effective, not because of the sheer weight of content. This intervention does not indulge jouissance with the bribe of morality, as Goya does. Instead, it underscores life in its slipping away from the grasp of the signifier. No judgment is made. The Chapmans offer Goya a collaboration at the level of line, with the supplement of their graffiti. But at the level of effect, they have transformed Goya. This can be followed through at the level of obscenity. Goya had already made an obscene world to support his satire. Its rapacity is organized around human organs which have been divested of all ideality. But even here one must notice that obscenity is a difficult economy to control. In order to work, it requires that it conveys to a spectator a minimum level of reality. Partly this is conveyed by the drawing, partly in some sense as being the violation of a taboo. This constraint is well known to the graffiti artist of the lavatory mural. You can draw a sketch of a penis and you can seek to intensify it by making it bigger, but beyond a certain point it just looks silly, or rather its relation to its owner begins to look silly. Obscenity can tolerate exaggeration, but not absurdity. Now the exaggeration obviously refers to other dimensions than size. One might consider the eyes that the Chapmans have been added, have added to the etchings. The eyes have here achieved a quasi-autonomous status. They do not exist as an, as an exaggeration. They are eyes projected onto another space and function. Their stalks are often literalized into an eye plant. To say that they do not result from exaggeration is to say that they do not have their origin in a naturalistic representation. 
The Chapmans have collaborated with Goya to head the pictures off from the rhetorical elision of disgust and exaggeration, the field of the obscene, into an intermediate path. Despite opinion to the contrary, the subject enjoys obscenity. It is true that at a conscious level, the subject may protest and squeal and demand that the thing is banned. But at an unconscious level, it is enjoying it. In the case of Goya, unconscious enjoyment of obscenity bribes its way past censorship by giving consciousness the excuse that these representations are all somehow in the service of morality. Enjoyment of obscenity certainly forces consciousness to adopt some curious alibis. But to turn the question round, we have seen that in the case of obscene graffiti, there are conditions which have to be met by obscenity in order to mobilize enjoyment. The most obvious of these is that, however crudely or extravagantly the object represented is, it must nevertheless be, at the level of fantasy, an object something is related to the body. Indeed, it is this relation that stands as the limit of the sexual. Jouissance is tied to the body. Enjoyment might tolerate, and to a certain extent, even encourage pictorial exaggeration. But at a certain point, representation takes its revenge on graffiti. The object is detached from any possible body and finds itself relegated to the spatial equivalent of nonsense. Put one way, the Chapmans have taken obscenity too far. By too far, we do not mean the usual sense of making work that is too scandalous, but rather in the other sense of having gone further than obscenity can tolerate. However one puts it, the effect is to have harnessed Goya in a direction that lies beyond obscenity. Or one could say that the gap between Goya's work and the Chapmans is the gap between obscenity and the very specific sense of beyond obscenity used here. This beyond obscenity is quite different from obscenity and can only be reached through it. Beyond obscenity describes not a type of representation, but rather a pathway through obscenity. Indeed, it can never be an independent form of representation. One can only draw, paint, or sculpt beyond obscenity by altering the relation to sexuality and the body of the existing field of representation. This particular field of art always takes the form of an intervention within what exists. It is appropriate that the exit from the obscene, the production of a certain kind of graffiti, takes the same form as many original attempts to transform a representation into the domain of obscenity. That is, through the addition to the body of breasts, naked penises, etc. At a formal level, we would have to say that the resulting images betray a representational gap, just as they betray two or three hands. This gap is intensified by the fact that while we have described Goya's work as obscene, we have described the Chapman's work as post-obscene. At a graphic level, the styles are different. Initially, registering the gap seems to predominate as an effect. But if we reread the image after the supplementation, then, as they say, the picture looks different. Here we trace a line from obscenity to post-obscenity, from sexuality to life. However, this raises the question of what the Chapmans are doing in this move, theoretically. Normally, the obscene, if we are thinking in terms of art and sublimation, is thought to be a form of desublimation. If that is the case, how do we characterize going beyond obscenity? Is it a renewed sublimation? Or is it, and this is my view, a DD sublimation, which empties out of pictorial representation any manifold and necessary relation between organs and bodies? Oh, I think I. Let us now see what the artists themselves say about their work and, the jo and their joint relation to it. An interview with Douglas Fort, F O G H T, in 1995 is a rich source of material. Two quotations. The first one uh, the interviewer asks, Why did you start working together as a team? Jake Chapman replies, Actually, Dinos had a great answer for it. He said, Because our own work is crap. 
And then he said, we're only good enough to make one person's work. Brilliant. <laughs> what is separate, separate, Jake and Dinos, comes to be fused in the non-origin of the work. Does this not make them intermediate artists who not accidentally produce intermediate objects? I will now develop some thoughts about the relation between the Chapmans as artists and their objects. I've got about five minutes more. Um, artistic collaboration can raise extreme anxieties and critics. At a preliminary level, it relates to the question of who did what. But behind this is the problem that inheres in the condition that an artwork is the product of an artist, and more, it is the product of a single artist. What is the singularity of the artist? Normally, the empirical answer is that a single artwork requires a single artist. Only to such a single figure can we attribute complex thoughts and modifications of them into the ultimate coherent synthesis of a single guiding intelligence. The thought of collaborative work raises a more awkward ratio. The at least two collaborators unify into one artist. The relations are different before and after con completion of the artwork. Before, there were two collaborators, each of whom have different relations to different objects. After completion, there are one artist whose relation to objects is singular. Having two collaborating artists introduces a problem of doubling, which is then further compounded at the symbolic level of this couple being brothers. The question of the double is, as it were, both redoubled and halved. Twice, there is the multiplication of their artistic identity once through their collaboration, and then again through their fraternity. But this last figure might also argue for a certain division at the heart of this multiplication, that they are less than two. Whatever artistic personality this is, doubled, doubled and halved, it's clearly of the order of monstrosity that the Chapmans bring forth in the work. You think of the zygotic ex acceleration, the multiple girls with the tennis shoes. Consider Dinos' answer to another question in the same interview. The interviewer asks, question is, what kind of objects are you producing? Dinos says, our activity is like the production of a skin rather than the production of a set of objects. It is a skin that seems to weld and suffocate whole territories. So we are dealing with singularities. Singularity abolishes the normal representational assumptions that the artist is representing a figure or an individual. The singularity is not so much a representation as a point in the field of multiplicities. It juts out like an object and its surroundings are covered by another element. It is as if the field could be thought of as a skin. It is true that the object is always mediated by the skin, but at the same time the skin contains all its objects. There is always another object in, a, in another place. So there is no unity to the singularity. The object, as we know it, becomes unstable. Singularities demonstrate the truth that the object, as we usually think of it, doesn't exist. In effect, the skin referred to here is equivalent to the way in which the Chapman brothers work when they paint over Goya's etchings. The skin is the body of their work. This skin is the body through which the Chapmans participate in the Goya and make Goya their brother. Whose brother? You can see that the monstrosity of the work is inextricably tied to the monstrosity of its non-origin. The Chapmans introduce monstrosity into their work through the intermediate status of the artist subject and the intermediate status of the object. It is this monstrosity that is linked to life. Goya had lowered the status of Lacan's life, and the Chapmans triumphantly reinstated. They reinstate what Goya had satirized via Goya. So in the one case, monstrosity is denigrated life, and in the other, it is the reinstatement of life. This new monstrosity is misunderstood and is denigrated in its turn by the viewing public. They are shocked. They think that painting over Goya originals is vandalism. They think that the Chapmans posture and try to shock. Even the Chapmans themselves think that they can't escape transgression. But in their work, they do that rare thing. They defer judgment. The order 
or rather disorder of comedy, is not about the random. It is about the mistaking of identities. Now, it is just the question of identity that is at issue in the Chapman's work. From the point of the, of the view of the artist, it is the form of the artist's work which provides materials for constructing an identity. But the form of the Chapman's work does just the opposite. It dissolves any sense of identity. This applies on the side of the artist, Jake, Dinos, Goya. It also applies on the side of the cultural object, Los Caprichos, or as a dog returns to its vomit, disasters of war, or insult to injury. of response that I'd like to sort of open up, but um, before I do that, as um, I think we worked very well last week, I'd like to see if anybody has a sort of burning question or kind of immediate point that they'd like to bring forward. So if, uh, if there is a, an immediate question, I'd definitely invite one. Okay, I'll start in, which, to in, which, in which case, <laughs> I'll uh, kind of begin with a, a, an observation about um, the idea of collaboration, which you brought out um, incredibly powerfully at the end, and I personally n didn't know that interview and was thought that was a, a kind of wonderful answer that you brought into play about, you know, the Chapman's not essentially being good enough to produce um, the work of only being good enough to produce the work of one artist. And I'm sure there are some people who think maybe they aren't even <laughs> you know, good enough to produce the work of one artist. Um, and that therefore that's where Goya comes in, that Goya comes into play to, co I mean, I'm aware that this is a, a criticism, if you like, of the Chapman's work, that, that, that if without Goya, the kind of propping them up, if you like, that they don't even add up to one artist. You know, what happens if you take Goya away? And I'd, by way of a sort of introductory question, I'd sort of ask, because what I think you've done is really problematize how close and how the idea of the intermediate object raises this, the stakes of what happens if you try to take Goya away. But why are you sticking to an old question? <laughs> because in a sense it's an old question, in a sense you're asking me an old question. Mm -hmm. um, what would they do without Goya? Whereas I'd prefer to say what they did with him, not, mm. not no, without I him. So, mm -hmm. because in, in a sense what they do with him is their artistic work. That's, well that, I guess that's your Sorry. answer. No, well that's, that's your my answer, position. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. To, um, to wonder, um, I was just trying to take a sort of an alternative critical position, is that what you've done is essentially really tie them up together to the point at which you can't imagine them coming apart, which is a very... But sure. actually, I had a quotation from you that I didn't use at the end, which says exactly that, of the Los Capriccios and Like a Dog series. Mm -hmm. This inextricability where you, mm -hmm. where you don't... Yeah, no, absolutely not. But I, I wondered, be precisely because that is a point through which they are... Um, Do you want to move? Because no, I'm fine. Dangerous I didn't oh, feel yeah. dangerous. I'm going to lose my head at some point. But, okay then, well, may maybe another way of, of, of thinking that through would be to think how collaboration kind of, um, <coughs> I guess, being a historian, thinking historically, how collaboration has has been um, used as a gambit by artists to kind of what, defer judgment's a nice way of putting it, to move beyond the kind of traditional way of, um, of thinking about producing objects. Well, I think Thomas did that last week, but very, very differently, obviously, from the Chapman's. Mm. Very differently, because it was like a starting point mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to set him off. Um, but it, it seemed to me, well, he, I think he was asked did that, it wasn't quite his choice. Uh, but I think there are, I think this question of relating to another artist comes up in a lot of work. But I'm sorry, but the first thing that comes to my mind is I've written about him with Joel Peter Witkin. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, most people know his work, but uh, I don't. I think some of the other artists 
interesting to do. Um, and it seems to me that um, what, he, what he needs to do there is to set up uh, a form of repetition, which is, so he has his own ingredients, which are bits of dead fetuses and arms and limbs from the New Mexico morgue, but he sets up the 17th century still life. Mm -hmm. I mean, recognizably, you know, mm -hmm. you know whose it is and which picture it is. Um, and he does this with um, Goyers as well, with the little boy. Um, and there's a reason for this. Uh, and it, in a sense, it is through this that something mm -hmm. gets done. And I, of course, I can't think of any other examples at the moment, but I feel that there are more and more, there is a reference to. Other, either, either other artists' work or something that is made to intervene on which the artist can operate. Well, so, yeah. well, which takes us quite a lo long way from the first question, what they've they done without Goya. Well, it, uh, it comes back to a question of what they think they can get out of it, or what, um, because they seem to get everything out of it. And if I, if I sort of, if I thought of other historical examples, which would be kind of surrealists deciding to write something together so that precisely they can inject chance or, in, or kind of be very creative or extra expressive. The Chapmans don't seem to be following that. They don't seem to be saying, well, if we work together, we won't work That's right, but then, but then all the consequences don't follow either for the surrealist game. Mm -hmm. They are not one artist. I mean, the work might be the, the result of a lot of people sitting around your table, but that's what it's the mm -hmm. result of. It's not one artist. That, that's what, um, I, well, yeah. what I thought was interesting about the Surrealist example is precisely if we think of two Surrealists sitting down in order to try not to write a novel by, by there being two of them. Are the Chapmans, um, in some sense, trying not to produce work in quite, in quite the same way by there being two of them? And I yes, yes, but nonetheless, the actual activity is very, very, very different. Mm -hmm. I wonder what, I'd, I'd like to invite any questions about yes, this sort of issue of collaboration. I think there might be tickings of. I, yeah, I want to ask questions. It's not in a sense purely about collaboration, but it's um, a question that actually Simon might be able to, is interested in as Parveen because it, to some extent, concerns George Bataille. Um, Bataille, in his book on Manet, places a creates a sequence between Goya and Manet in which he writes um, that Manet manages in the execution of Maximilian to create a sense of dis the dispassionate, of absolute bleakness and objectivity that Goya attempts but ultimately fails because Goya is a child of the Enlightenment. Um, I think two th well, there are kind of two things. One, I'd like to propose that we might find a precursor to that, to the kind of pre-enlightenment in the work of Jacques Callot, but also that, in a sense, why Goya, for the Chapmans, who, kind of with their awareness of the work of Bataille, would doubtless have been aware of that positioning of Goya by Bataille, is that because, in a sense, they find in Goya a site of meaning which is absent in Manet, and a site, therefore, that they can, however perversely, continue to create meaning themselves, that in a sense, that the Chapmans themselves remain perhaps disfigured in the way, a manner of their own cartoons, but remain child, children of the Enlightenment. Not sure I follow that, do you want to answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems a hell of a complicated question for me to answer, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'd like, I could bring that back to something that, Parveen, something that you said at the end, which is about moving away from judgment or deferring judgment. Now, to relate to that question, the problem with Goya seems to be that he can be tied back into that enlightenment discourse. Now, what I was taking from what you were saying at the end was that if, we, I mean, a term that you never used, and the Chapmans do use about their own work, is that they've improved Goya. They say they've improved, mm -hmm. the, the drawings say in the exhibitions, yes, um, yes. improved, 83 yes. improved yes, etchings. Yes, all the Right, yeah. so maybe the improvement is precisely in relation to what you were saying, the improvement is to somehow deal with that enlightenment kind of morality, yeah. to move beyond stating a moral case. I mean, to take Goya out of, uh, a rede in Bataille's terms, a redeemable kind of enlightenment morality. But I thought that's what I was arguing. Well, exactly, yeah, that's what I'm yes. saying. I, 
I think that's what yeah. he was saying. That what they what the Chapmans do is precisely take that loop out of yes. Goya. But in that sense, then you are actually almost saying that okay, the Chapmans would both kind of improve Goya, but nonetheless remain entirely within that Enlightenment discourse. No. Because it seems no. to me that they are, in a sense, you're saying you're, say, you're constructing great. this position that we have Goya, my brother, that at the same time as they are improving, they are nonetheless, they nonetheless, and I guess you know, to some point, <coughs> that they remain fixated upon Goya because Goya provides for them in that apparent field of, kind of, of absolute horror, nonetheless, a position of sentimentality. Yes, but one which they don't take up. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think I was suggesting the opposite. I, I think I thought their improvements, well, obviously they've ruined the actual <laughs> prints, right? <laughs> they're not improved, but they've improved the, the moral moorings of the images and yes. taken them outside. You know, obviously the prints are not improved. Yes, but at the same time, they're not, they're not vitiating the sentimentality yes, that Goya remains there. They, they, they are actually they're shifting the register of it, if you like, but from tragedy to comedy. But they, rem they, remain, they remain in the register of sentimentality. <coughs> well, I don't think they are in the register. What I tried to say was I don't think that they start in the register of tragedy, although they get talked about like mm. that. I think they're in the register of what I call obscenity. I mean, I'm not mm -hmm. okay, Goya experts here, but that's, that's what I seem to be saying. I found myself saying this. Um, so you, you have that suffering, you have the jouissance of, of especially the disasters of war, but actually it's rather serious. Um, and my argument was that by the form of repetition which makes you think that they join Goya, but by doing it and overdoing it, that's the post-obscene mm -hmm. argument, they produce a gap which is, which is a gap of nonsense or, the, or nothing. If you produce a gap and you're facing the real, there isn't a question of Sri Sans anymore. Mm -hmm. it, it was like meant to be the theoretical parallel argument. You could still say that was a wrong as, as, as well. But, but that was, so you're totally unconvinced because you're, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> 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 there's another question over there, I think. Uh, it's not a question, it, it's just a, a, a good, set of uh, yeah. observations or points that might shift the thing a little bit. Um, and it is to do with to do with <laughs> it's to do with technique. Um, we need to recall that the uh, disasters are etchings. They're not lithographs. They're not engravings. Uh, they're not silk screens. They're not oil paintings. Now, etching has a uh, anyone who's done it, and I have a peculiarly intense kind of chemical carnality. Uh, you gouge, you pour acid, you sprinkle resin that melts and then resists acid and so on. So they're very physical. Now, um, there is a long tradition, of course, of using reproductions uh, in modernism, which was a Benjamin comments on. And of course, montage um, of photographs is considered uh, really you know, it, it's fairly well established, obviously. Um, so, I simply want to make the point that by working on a cycle of etchings directly, um, and it could only be this set, because I, ca I, I can't think of any other uh, comparable uh, set of prints, um, that there's a, there's a uniqueness about form and, and subject matter here, uh, which I think needs to be commented on, because by directly working on those prints, um, there's a, a kind of reiteration at, at some level, uh, even though uh, all the other displacements of which you've spoken uh, are going on. Thank you. Maybe I could bring in another kind of uh, point which I w would have, I'm glad to have the opportunity to raise, which is particularly about the, the issue of um, comedy um, that, you, that, you, uh, that you're bringing up. And I wondered, and again, this is a, 
this is a rather selfish um, point, if you like, but I wondered, is that going on? No, um, it's just that I found the double-headed Goya. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope to preside over the discussion. Right. <laughs> I, I wondered about the, the relationship of the kind of, um, again, this goes back to the, one of the previous questions as well, the kind of um, comedic aspect that you're, that you're bringing out um, about the, the Chapmans and the kind of um, the value of humour in, in um, the way that um, Bataille, for example, talks about Goya, which I think is incredibly productive. And the question I wanted to pose to you is about duration. And this, does re this relates to how, the chap how serious we might take Chapman's work. Now, one, another criticism of the Chapman's work is that it's, it's essentially a kind of one-liner, that once you've, once you've seen it, you've got it. Now, Bataille's uh, idea of the way that um, humour works is that it only lasts very momentarily, that it, it, it's something that allows you to leap out of mm -hmm. a difficult situation, but then it, it quickly kind of um, disintegrates, it quickly kind of falls away, like a firework or something. How does that relate to your, I mean, if that's not too much of a, a loaded question, but how does that relate to the idea of comedy as something which works through a series and kind of continues to work through a series of works, or does it? I, th I think if, it, if I've understood you, that question of temporality do doesn't bother me. I mean, it doesn't, it, I didn't raise it, I didn't think of this as a series necessarily. Uh, because the effect, however momentary, is going to be etching by, by mm -hmm. etching, mm -hmm. um, seems to me momentary, but immensely, immensely important. Mm -hmm. um, especially at the level that I'm trying to argue on a kind of psychoanalytic level. I mean, if you actually think of, um, I, I, I'll go ahead and say it, if you actually think of things that happen in analysis, uh, you can have something very momentary. Uh, it's not going to last in that form. It might have enormous consequences, and unknown to you how they come about. Mm -hmm. And so in one sense, the kind of registration is momentary and that's good enough for me. But maybe there was another question about the series that, that was in there. But I was just thinking about um, extending this idea of using humor as a way of leaping out of extending that over 83 images or over, I mean, the, the exhibition that, that where these yeah. things were had 300 odd pictures. Everything was part of the series. That relates to the point that was just made actually about etching as a medium. I mean, they were making their own etchings yes. as well as painting over etching. So there's a sort of... But, but uh, I, mean, what I mean, what is that except overload? Yeah. <laughs> which, which actually is very important for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a sense that that was why that exhibition was so so very, very successful. You know, the, the White Cube Gallery was just stuffed, and it actually got um, walls within the, the, the square, so you had about eight walls on, on which there was just a massive amount of, of material, which I think is part of the way they, they work, actually. Uh, well, abso I absolutely yeah. agree, and yeah. I, I do wonder how that relates to, to, to being able I mean, to sort of be spontaneous, if you like. And and spontaneously funny over and over and over and over again. Yeah, there's a question there. Um, um, yeah, I just wanted to, to finesse, um, <laughs> would like to finesse the argument a bit, because it seems to me that if you leave it that, um, you know, Goya is this straight arrow enlightenment figure, um, you know, totally on the side of reason and, you know, a, a firm norm, permitting satire, that you actually do Goya an injustice. And you might think of the Chapmans as they're bringing something out in Goya, which has actually been repressed. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Now you say that, I, I think there are paragraphs missing. I don't know how this could have happened. <laughs> it's because absolutely, absolutely, I give yeah. Schultz's, I mean, this is appalling. I give Schultz's <laughs> argument, and then I catch myself treating like you're saying. And I thought, this is ridiculous. It's, it's to bring out and recuperate, I mean, precisely. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> I better go on. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I've got several paragraphs on this. I, I think it was more from, from the crazy in the conversation than, than from your paper. But that, I no, but it was missing. I suddenly realized it was missing. Right. Yes. Right. And I actually made 
made a point of saying, but I'm going doing this instead of get it. Get it. So, so Thank they're, you. they're extremely <laughs> sensitive readers, is the way that's one way to, to put it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's a question right yes. at the back. We might need the microphone for that one. I have a question that's on sort of slightly uh, a similar kind of a line. I was kind of sitting there, I was wondering a little bit um, about, b because you talked a bit about the Enlightenment and sort of the way that, that what the Chapmans might be doing might be kind of moving away from sort of an Enlightenment sort of attitude. They're moving away from a kind of a, 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 a sort of a parodic, satiric critique which relates to a norm. Uh, I was kind of wondering how you might situate the Chapmans <coughs> in relationship to perhaps the way that contemporary culture on the whole has been understood to be moving away from that kind of uh, a, a society with a centre that holds, that's, that's normative, the that movement from parody to pastiche in Jameson's terms. Um, so <coughs> th th does kind of corporate mass culture already kind of empty things out create gaps in the way that you're saying that the Chapmans do? Or are they doing something that stands in opposition and is, is kind of contradictory to the sort of the way that, that mass culture might be taking up Goya and making it banal and putting clown faces on it and things like that, turning it into cliches? Well, isn't my answer in my paper, in a sense? I mean, I, I can't give you a sociological answer, but uh, to the extent that there's a certain effectivity in work, I can't believe that messing around with Goya for ads and so on would necessarily have the same effect. I mean, it's done, as Maggie was point <laughs> pointing out just now, with, with quite a, a sure touch and a, and a, a recognition of uh, the different components, if you like, of the effect that Goya has, has today. It was actually used a very, I mean, it must have been with the Chapman's permission almost, I think, but there was a recent series on Mall 4 about the war in Iraq, and the ad for it on television was exactly painted faces um, on, on yeah, the soldiers. Clowns, clowns with yeah. Yeah, like silver hair. Yes, but on, it was on, the, on, on mm. photographs of the soldiers. Um, now, I, I must say that I didn't actually like that. I didn't think about it anymore, but I didn't like it. Because in, in and of itself, I, I'm, I, I'm really not sure at all that it had the same effect as the Chapman Brothers were, has. But maybe, uh, but it's also very difficult to tell. It's one television, you know, image, and very fleeting as part of, as part of an ad. But it seemed, it seemed to me, in a sense, to cheapen the Chapman. I was very interested when I first saw it. The second time I saw it, I was very disgusted. But it's not an answer to your question, really. Maybe somebody else wants to comment on that. I'd very much like this to turn into a you know, bigger discussion with, with people in the audience speaking. Yeah. Brian. dealt with that, or whether that's a slightly different way of thinking about it. But it seems to me interesting in what you've done, um, if I might generalise for a moment, because I think one could generalise an argument about representation itself from what you've been describing mm -hmm. at work here. And one of the things that seems very interesting in what you've done is the kind of synchronicity that you manage to ascribe to these works so that you have a kind of mutual system of pressures between the Chapmans mm -hmm. and Goya. Uh, you have this kind of double structure of doubling um, and you have this um, kind of comic uh, economy of, uh, of comedy in some way and, and this series of relationships that you've mapped out. 
There's something about that synchronicity, I guess, I wanted to ask you about, because it seemed to me that, you know, the question of what Goya does to the Chapmans is opened up in a rather interesting way that obviously is, you know, you're not meant to think like that if you think kind of historically, but because you've kind of thrown things up in the air somewhat, it becomes a question, perhaps. Honestly, I'm not sure if it's a question I can ask. It sort of adds to the, <laughs> to the, um, <coughs> it's, it's, um, I don't know whether one would be forced to say that, uh, trying to think of, of the Chapman's previous work. I mean, I think, no, I think all the stuff about the skin applies to the previous work, but uh, when they, w when they produce their stuff for the Tate um, competition, I've forgotten, forgotten what it's called, you know. Donald Yes, the Donald <laughs> <laughs> um, It was already very, influenced by Goya, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, with the maggots from the magic shop or wherever they got them from and so on. Uh, you could trace that, that back, really, uh, to great deeds, I guess. Yeah. You can immediately one can easily recognize that. So I was, I was trying to think how much of Goya was there in them before they turned to Goya, <laughs> is how I want to yeah. rephrase your question, uh, I guess. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. But it's, it's, worth, it's worth thinking yeah. about. I also thought if I could just follow up that, because it seems to me that's a, an interesting way of putting it, and also the way in which you talked about their collaboration. It seems to me that that's quite an interesting way to think about the work of any number of artists who are, who are working on their own, as it were. I mean, obvious examples might be somebody like Boetti, who makes photographs of twins of himself. You know, this whole way in which, you know, doubling is something that I think is, um, you know, one can track that in interesting ways. It doesn't literally... But, that, but that's two. doubling a subject matter, is it? Yes, he, d he superimposes two photographs of himself holding hands and splits his name, Alighieri e Boetti. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, I think there are any number of examples that in one sense which, just to repeat what I said before, I mean, I think what the implication here is about the structure of representation itself, which seems to me, and how this idea of mistaken identity kind of But that seems to me a that. kind of intellectual comment. It's there, that's partly also what I mean by subject matter, you know, he's telling you about this through, by doing this, he's making his comment, and it's, I it's don't think it has that intellectual ah. distance because I think it is a comic strategy. And I right. think there is this moment of you know, release and something kind of infantile about it. I mean, you know, I think yes, there's something yes, yes. simple and infantile and just a, a kind of moment of release there. Very different from this, but it just seems to me to be, you know, what you're getting at is something about the kind of core of something mm. going on and mm. the the role of the comedic in it, that seems kind of important. It, it, may, uh, it, it may imme immediately made me think of um, that uh, Edgar Allan Poe story, William Wilson, where the guy doesn't know who's following him around and screwing everything up for him, and it turns out to be himself in some kind of strange way. That there's a sort of, you don't know what you're doing to yourself, or what part of yourself you've put away. And I think the Goya, and, I mean, Goya could continually turn up for the Chapmans and screw things up for them and also make things better. He's, there's like yes. a kind of yeah. a split <laughs> part yeah. of, I think that, I mean, Bri I think Bryony's points, yeah. in, in that sense is really interesting. In, and in terms of the studio or a, a kind of practice, I mean, Goya's hanging around the studio. He's always, he's there, kind of. His stuff's muddled up with their stuff. You know, it's kind of. Is that another point over?
intuitive way, in such a way that it's, it seems inseparable from the original etching, um, is to do something which is, as it were, not montage and not digital either. Um, we, mon in montage uh, and collage, when you stick something over something, the break is apparent and there's an, uh, an alienation in, 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 in the difference between the image which is stuck onto the older one underneath or whatever. Um, and um, with, of course, with digital manipulation, uh, on a computer screen, you can make anything meld and, and uh, morph into anything. Um, and uh, it seems to me that there's, by, by really going at the, at the etchings themselves, as you go on the etch, go at the etching plate, there's some kind of um, a different take, to say the least, on what it is to manipulate the body of images as much as the image of the body, as it were. Um, I mean, ever since, uh, at least since, uh, since Warhol and, and, uh, and, and thoughts about the mediation of, of images, we've got used to the fact that you can do anything with images um, except, of course, deface an original image. The etching is a, a sort of intermediate uh, condition between a unique object like an oil painting. Um, although Oscar Yuan did those detournements of oil paintings back in the 50s, but they, they were considered valueless. But uh, I'm trying to think, <coughs> what is it that is done uh, not, not just to the image of the body in, in, um, in, in Goya, <coughs> but as it were, to the status of the image of the body in works such as, uh, as, as, as Goya's or, or the heritage of images that we, that we have. It's as if, in a sense, all those captions like, and this is worse, uh, and more, uh, could be said of what we can do with images, as it were. Um, <coughs> except that in this case, it's a sort of sacred site being chosen that, gosh, it's a real Goya. You know, it's not just some, a computer screen that's being manipulated. Now, when they do the bodies of the little uh, uh, boys and girls uh, with glass fiber, the glass fiber is a kind of three-dimensional equivalent, I think, to the computer screen. And so morphing uh, is, in a, is in a different register there. I don't, I don't know whether that's completely coherent, what I'm saying, but there, there's something to do with the, the quiddity of, of the etched image and the actual fact that they're painted on, on, on it as opposed to merely manipulating digital uh, figures on screens or silk screens or whatever. And I, th I think that is really somehow important. But uh, are you saying that perhaps that's one way in which what I call the vitality, the obscene vitality of, of Goya is maintained? I mean, certainly isn't there in great deeds. Uh, well, I, I suppose the, the obscene vitality of art is maintained. Goya is a sort of... One way of coming back to that yeah. as well is, obviously the exhibition was full of stuff based on colouring in books, and one of the things they're... Evident, one of the things, very kind of one-liners that they're obviously making is etchings are the same as colouring in books. You can get loads of them. You can colour them in. Um, there are lots of sets of Goyas floating around and there are lots of colouring in books floating around and you know it's quite easy to make a mistake colouring something in, as we all know. Um, I think this one is from the series called Gigantic Fun. Mm -hmm. So you've got great deeds again, against the dead. It's not from the series I was talking about, it's from the series called Gigantic Fun, which is also a white cake. <coughs> is, is there time for one more question? Is if there is one more question. Um, if not, I'd finally like to um, thank you very much and uh, say that the uh, paper and its responses are absolutely fantastic. And I think about it an enormous amount to, to the way that we might think about the, the Chapman's work. Thank you very much.